Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's talk gardens. We're so excited to have you here with us again. I, my name is Cindy Brown. I am the manager of collections, education, and access, and I will be your moderator today. And our guest today is Alex Denker. Alex is one of our horticultures, one of our many wonderful, marvelous horticultures that are so uh, gifted in what they do. And he's going to talk to us about alternatives with using native plants instead of some of the plants that you may not want in your garden once you understand that the natives are better for the ecosystems and the habitats in the situation that situations that Alex is going to talk about. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. I will curate the questions and ask them to Alex at the end of his presentation. If we don't have, get a chance to answer all the questions, we will be providing some of the answers on our website uh, the, in our video library. And the information on that video library will be shown in the chat box. And that's where you can find all of our past videos as well. We do share them, uh, save them and share them on our video library once they've been closed captioned and uh, everything is in good shape. So you can see all of our past uh, videos on that. We have an overabundance of attendees today. So I'm sure that video is going to be very popular when it gets posted up on site. And if you would like to see the closed captions, please do put the CC, uh, press the CC button on your computer, and that will allow you to be able to see the closed captions that we're creating today. They won't be perfect, but they're pretty good. Uh, and with that, oh, and at the end of our presentation, you'll be sent a link to participate in the survey. This survey has been very important to us to understand who is coming to our webinars. We are participating in an American Public Gardens Association uh, program on sustainability. And one of those questions asks who is coming to our programs. So we'd like to know, and there are just a couple of simple questions in a survey. We appreciate your help with filling that out at the end of the presentation. With that, Alex Denker, native plant guru, Will you please share with us your information that you have and excite us about some of these native plants that you think make great alternatives to the invasive plants that some of us have in our gardens. And we always wanna say, we're not against using all types of plants, but at Smithsonian Gardens, we do not encourage the use of plants that will overwhelm an ecosystem and not allow the native insects and birds have an opportunity to succeed in your gardens. So that's what we want to make sure that you understand that we're not anti-plant, we're against anti-bugs. Right, Alex? Right, exactly. Okay, so okay. I'll disappear. I'll see you at the end of the presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Cindy. I appreciate all that. Um, so a couple of things I'd like to do. Uh, through the, through the talk here. I have a whole bunch of um, uh, invasives highlighted. We're gonna talk about each one. And then I'm also gonna try to, with each one, I'm gonna try to, to, to give you guys a really good alternative, at least one alternative for each one. Also, I'd like to try to, in the beginning, as well as throughout the talk, try to talk a little bit about what the definition of a uh, alien plant, what's the definition of an, of an alien invasive, What's the definition of a native plant? Talk a little bit about the cultivar issue. So kind of th this whole thing is actually has a lot of definitions and it can be a little bit wonky and a little bit like, you know, it sounds a little bit preachy. Don't want that to be that way. But like Cindy said, uh, I, there's a lot of uh, non-native uh, non plants I love. Um, but I think the big thing, best thing we could do right off the bat is stop. Um, uh, buying and stop stop using in our gardens ones that we know that have a proven track record. They're going to escape your yard and they're going to go into the green spaces around your neighborhood, going to go into the uh, the public parks and the and and the uh, the, the woodlands and we, we can see the damage they make. Okay. So um so what is, what is a native plant? Okay. And there's a lot of definitions. Uh, and this one here, I, I like a lot. 
a naturally occurring plant to a particular area or ecosystem uh, without without human uh, uh, effort, without human introduction. And basically at that point, almost by definition then, that plant then has a symbiotic relationship with each other, with everything from insects way up the food chain to birds. Um, it has uh, with the soil, with the amount of water that, that that's incoming. Um, and it has a symbiotic relationship and then therefore it's able to support wildlife because they're included in the, in the, in, in the equation, right? So where on the other side of it is uh, an invasive species, non-native that's come here and uh, takes over, becomes a monoculture, if you will. It doesn't know when to stop, has no off button, if you will, and it makes a mess, okay? So that photo there on the right, that's a collection of uh, a Japanese barberry. Uh, this is very close to where I walk my dog, about five miles from here in the woods, deep into the woods. All that green fuzz, that's Japanese barberry when it's in, when it's in too much shade, it all turns green. And there's also a lot of oriental bittersweet in there. So all the other stuff that's supposed to be there is gone, okay? So there's no, there's no little oak seedlings coming up. There's no uh, spring ephemerals. There's no ferns, nothing. It's just this mush. So, and that's the, that's the damage, okay? And on the other side of that, very, very few, if any, insects can use oriental bittersweet as their food. So not only does it take the place of the native species, but then it has nothing to give in return, okay? I mean, at least if it would replace it, but then, oh, it, did, oh, it doesn't do that. <laughs> so so it, it's a big mess, so, okay? One other thing here that's really important is this talk, I'm not gonna talk about kudzu. I'm not gonna talk about multifloros. Yes, those are horrible invasives, but for the most part, you can't go to a garden center now and buy multifloros or you can't buy kudzu, okay? The things I'll be talking about today are plants that are sold uh, in, the, in the trade. Uh, you, can, you can buy them, you can put them in your yard. They're still talked about as being beautiful and wonderful and terrific. Well, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to convince you, why don't we try some other things here, okay? Because we know where this story ends, okay? The scope of the problem, uh, as much as I said earlier, there's a couple good definitions there uh, from Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, it basically outcompetes native species for, for resources, okay? And um, they have a certain, all these invasive species have again and again and again, you'll see every one of these slides, they put out tons of seeds. Um, they have uh, sucker growth, um, and they all develop into a monoculture. Okay, and the big picture is it's incredibly difficult. If at the very least, it's incredibly expensive to try to remove them. Okay, uh, if not impossible. Okay, um, so, and uh, one more quick thing before we get into our slides here for real. Uh, what are what are these native plants and uh, what is it that these native plants actually do? And the big thing is they provide four things for habitat. And I don't care if you're a bird, uh, a cardinal or a robin living around my house or a polar bear or a grizzly bear or something living in uh, a grizzly bear living in uh, Yosemite or um, uh, Yellowstone. Everybody needs food, water, cover and a place to raise their babies. Almost every creature. OK. And that's not even even we do. We all need the same thing. OK, so uh, and these these aliens will not uh, they, these invasive aliens take over an area and that all these wonderful things are taken away. So it destroys the entire habitat. OK. So moving on to the uh, the, the first plant here uh, was actually quite heavily planted in the 70s and 80s. I think often nowadays it's uh, looked upon as uh, a bad guy, if you will. It's seen in a lot of websites now by a lot of states, uh, a couple Midwest states, I think Minnesota, Michigan, uh, Upper Midwest, they're, it's considered an uh, uh, invasive alien. It's illegal to, to buy and sell them. Um, the big thing is the gorgeous flower. It's very, very pretty there. If you kind of squint and kind of look at it there on the, on the left, in that neighborhood there in suburban Maryland. Um, but it seeds like crazy. 
And when it goes when it goes from this neighborhood into the woodlands, you see the photo on the right, it's not the same tree anymore. It's this gnarly thicket thing and it's got these big old thorns on it. It's like it's it's you can't even walk four feet because it's it's like a it's like a thicket. And it's just really thick and dense. And uh again, no no insect larvae can eat the leaves. Uh I think bees might get on the flower, but you know, so it's but other than that, there's not much, okay? The big thing is it's completely out of place and doesn't belong here. So the big thing is imagine it goes into the forest, it leaves out, okay? When it's leafed out, it's taking the place of, let's say, an oak tree, which would be not leafed out yet. Well, now because it's leafed out earlier than it's supposed to be, underneath now it's dark and all the spring ephemerals, things like columbine, mertensia, Virginia bluebells, all those things now are not going to get any sun and they're going to slowly decline. So it's at a sequence to everything around. And that's and not to mention that it makes a monoculture. So it just keeps getting worse and worse. So uh, one of the, the guys I always thought would be a great uh, su um, a substitute would be uh, uh, Allegheny serviceberry. OK, native plant, great fall color, fantastic uh, fruit in uh, late spring. Um, I would say in June, it's that great fall color. It's one of these plants that really is a four season plant. And when you see something like this, you're like, well, then what's the issue? Why, why not plant? This is a wonderful plant, it's a great addition to any garden. Um, and there are uh, other species uh, that you could, you could also put in that are, that are uh, amelanchers as well. Okay. So that are uh, amelanchers arborea is another great one. Okay. So Definitely, definitely, definitely should, should be planting more of these. I don't see them too much as a real street tree. So in that sense, it might not be the best substitute for um, uh, the, um, the Bradford, but I thought it was a good choice because of the white flower. But uh, it's got, again, fantastic fall color here as well. And by the way, uh, there's, a, there's several Lepidoptera species that use this as a host plant, okay? Uh, which is not just good for moths and butterflies, but also good for birds. Because we know 96% of mommy birds feed their baby off insect larvae. So that's good for the bird population. And then, of course, birds will go after the fruit. Next one is a tree of heaven. A tree of heaven has uh, been around for quite a while um, uh, in, in, in North America. Very, very tough. It's in a legume family, so it's a pea. So it can grow in some really, really crappy soil. So you can see why people... Uh, planted it and then put it everywhere because it, it's, it's super tough. It's a, you know, it's, it's a legume, pulls nitrogen from the air, takes care of its own, so to speak, but it is uh, seeds like crazy and spreads to the, to the forest around your house and, and when, when in public parks and et cetera, it makes a big mess. So this, by the way, is a, is one of our native Circus canadensis, uh, the great red bud. Um, it's a, uh, it's another pea family member, so it's a legume as well. Um, it has a great big seed pod in the fall. Uh, beautiful heart-shaped leaf uh, will, will, will come out. But before the leaves come out, when everything is still completely bare, it has this beautiful, that bottom photo there, those peas, they were right on, the, right on the branch, right on the stick, if you will. It doesn't come out with the foliage. So it's really quite dramatic, okay? And even in the wintertime, uh, if you have a mature red bud, the, the branching is actually quite elegant and quite pretty. And then it's got very, very nice uh, uh, fall colors, that, that beautiful yellow. Okay? And they actually hold, hold the leaves for quite a while. Um, and um, it can also be multi-stemmed. That top photo there was uh, air in space a couple of years ago. And uh, I had those prunes. I took off all the suckers, which made those nice, you know, those nice upright trunks. Very, very pretty. And it's also a, uh, a larva host for uh, uh, Henry's elfin um, moth, which is kind of neat. So, and I believe others too. So, um, this Norway maple here is probably, at least it was a couple of years ago, I don't know if it still is, it was the number one planted tree in America. Okay. Um, you can see why it was used in a so popular suit as a good street tree. Nice shape. You know, it's very full, got great fall color. But the problem is it seeds like nobody's business, goes into the forest, and then we know the story. Um, so 
it's 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 a problem. It's it's, it's a big it's a big 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 mess. So and 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 also from if you do plant it in your garden, the um, uh, the the roots, if you will, very are very very near the surface, very sh uh, shallow rooted. So it would make any kind of um, let's say spring ephemerals or anything like that in in the forest have a have a very very hard time of it. So um, this is our uh, native uh, Asa rubrum, the, uh, the red maple. Okay, uh, it also has the same issue with very uh, fibrous roots near the surface, and big roots near the surface, but uh, it, it's it's not going to seed like crazy, uh, at least not the way the Norway does. Um, but that fall color is incredible. There's uh, lots and lots and lots of cultivars to choose from, um, and just that reminds me. This is a good opportunity here. This is a good good shot here. Uh, the idea of a cultivar. So what is that? A cultivar is something that's been done in the trade, okay, as a grower, or it's been collected in some way. Uh, they they take a native plant and they they like the attribute. This one out of all these, let's say, Acer rubrums, this one particular Acer rubrum has a particular attribute that I like. Has incredible fall color, better than all these others. And then then they propagate it put a name on it, like there's one called Red October that has incredible fall color, okay? And then that is sold as Acer Rubrum Red October all over the United States. So anytime you buy an Acer Rubrum Red October, they're all an exact clone of that exact same one from that, from that original plant, okay? So uh, there's a little bit of, uh, gee whiz, what do we do now in the industry? Native plants are supposed to be boosting uh, uh, biodiversity, but by having all these clones, we're actually in maybe in some wacky way reducing biodiversity because we're using the same one over and over and over and over, and over again. So um, uh, that's a bit of a, something I, I think about a lot. There's a lot of research on that. Sometimes we are finding that pollinators are uh, actually going after sometimes the cultivars more, but I think that's kind of rare, I think. I think the big thing is if you are going to go for a flower, and we'll go show some other examples a little bit in a bit here. If you are going to go for a flower, let's say, um, sometimes the double flowers that have not just petals like that, but petals like that, maybe those we can stay away from because the bee won't do the normal thing that it does to get inside to get to the pollen. So, uh, so maybe it's not as great for pollinators. So, but please, it's something we can maybe probably talk about at the end of my presentation, uh, the, the, the cultivar issue, but uh, it's something to think about. Uh, I use cultivars around the building, American history. I use cultivars around my house. Uh, to me, I still call them native plants, but maybe with an asterisk next to it. So uh, certainly better than putting in a, a you know Japanese barberry, that's for sure. So, <laughs> But uh, next one I have here is uh, uh, Ampelopsis, which is porcelain berry. Uh, it's in the grape family. So you know it grows like crazy and you know it seeds like nobody's business. Uh, that photo on the, the right there, that's kind of what it does. That's that that's a mess, you know, and it's just gonna keep getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, I've seen it, it says they're 20 feet or more. I've seen it 40 feet. So, um, and it's really, really hard to, to control. The birds will come grab the berry and they drop it 50 yards that way, 100 yards that way. And then it just proliferates very, very quickly. Okay. Uh, this is another great family uh, uh, member. This is um, Parthenocystis quintifolia. So this guy is Virginia creeper. Okay. It can be used as a ground cover, very flat, very low. If it does, if it is in a lot of shade, right, it wants to find the sun. So it will climb a tree. You got to be careful of that. Uh, I've never seen it kill a tree. I've never seen it totally overwhelm a tree or swamp a tree like English ivy or porcelain berry, but you might want to keep your eyeball on it. It's probably nothing. I wouldn't say it's then low maintenance or no maintenance. You got to go out there every once in a while and maybe contain it because it does creep. Like it's what, it's what it does, right? It's a creeper, <laughs> but uh, it's got incredible fall color. And if you put it in the right spot and you have a big area, it could be nice and flat way in the back of your property somewhere. It does its job. It's a great thing. And if it climbs a tree like that on the right, who cares? It just as long as it doesn't go all the way to the top and kill the tree. 
if you have it near your house, it will probably climb the house. That's not a good idea, so I'd pull it off because um, it's trying to trying to find the sun. Okay. Uh, is another very very popular plant, uh, Chinese wisteria. See the photo there on the right. Gorgeous, you know, presentation. Gorgeous. When you walk up to that house, you go, "Wow, what an inviting place to to visit," you know. But then you see the, the mess on the left, and that's what happens to it. And um, uh, it's it's awful. Okay. And it's not just, it has these, these unbelievable, as big as probably your, maybe your pinky, these, these runners that go, I guess it's part of the vine, goes under, almost not on the ground, but it's almost on top. And you couldn't possibly uh, just pull them. You have to cut them. And they go in all directions. And then eventually, vegetatively, it will sprout from that upward. It makes it really, really challenging to uh, try to uh, try to control that or eradicate it or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, it's rough. It's horrible. And the bad thing is there's no reason for it because we have two wonderful wisterias. One is wisteria frutescens, and um, uh, that, that's the one on the uh, left there. Uh, I mean, it has that, that picture there. That's my backyard where they have that the bottom photo there with my tape measure. I just did that to show you how big that flowers every bit of seven, eight, nine inches. OK, um, on the uh, frutescens, which is the American wisteria. It's kind of a lavendery, but on the um, um, uh, Wisteria macrostachy, it's, it's more of a bluish tint. But they're both um, wonderful uh, substitutes. I don't think anybody would be disappointed. Uh, I have mine in quite a bit of shade, so it doesn't flower as much, but it still flowers very, very heavy. And I'm still very happy with it. And it, it grows very moderately i don't have to it's not going to eat the house not going to eat the you know the neighbors or anything it's it's a it's a great and it hasn't escaped it's, it's a great plant so uh and i haven't tried uh macrostachy at my house or downtown at the museum but i have tried protestants and i'm very very happy with it so and it's a great uh substitute for the chinese or japanese wisteria oriental bittersweet i see this all over the woods around my house and it does that to every tree that i on the picture there on the right it's just climbing up that tree uh, and the birds come and grab this colorful uh, uh, berry looking thing and whoop, away it goes. The right photo is the berry for the American bittersweet. OK, so uh, you have to ID. It's pretty close, <laughs> but uh, one is certainly better than the other. That's for sure. OK, uh, and one other thing is sometimes it's used in fall decorations. So if you get like, you know, you go to the store, you get this beautiful decoration, you put it on your front door. And then when the season is over, you throw it away, you put it in the compost pile, you're, you're throwing out the seed. So be careful of that. OK. I thought a good substitute for uh, a bittersweet, uh, the one of bittersweet would be uh, cross vine, bignonia, one of my one of my favorite uh, vines. It's actually, uh, at least in my neighborhood here in suburban Maryland, it's a um, it's an evergreen. Occasionally, I'd say maybe one out of three or four years. It, we have a really cold winter. It dies to the ground, and I was like, "Wow, maybe it's dead." Oh no! And then it it came back like it was never even um, it, it, totally unharmed. It was gorgeous, um, very very pretty, uh, very nice glossy thick foliage. Uh, deer don't seem to uh, to mess with it too much, uh, but and got that really nice trumpet flower, so it's good for uh, hummingbirds. So it's a it's a great plant, and it blooms like crazy. So. Wonderful, wonderful plant. I, and I almost never see it anywhere. So it's uh, easily found in the in the trade, but no one ever plants it, which is unfortunate. Uh, but this is probably the not just the essence, but the quintessence of this whole uh, this talk is is English ivy. Uh, people don't know it has that purple looking berry uh, looking thing, and of course birds will come and take that, and away it goes, and they spread it. And uh, so that up top there is kind of the the uh, fruiting mechanism and there's the, the the product down there people don't usually see that they just see the thing on the left see the way it's climbing that tree so the virginia creeper in my knowledge i've never seen the virginia creeper do that so but this is a, this is what english ivy does it will climb this tree and that tree is probably toast at some point here so uh and if not how how's the person going to manage that mess you know so it's 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 horrible so uh, one plant, you know, that we know so well is uh, a pachysandra, regular little pachysandra. But uh, there's the uh, Allegheny spurge, 
which is uh, native to our to, uh, to North America. Um, the new foliage is um, uh, kind of comes comes out that mottled, uh, very interesting looking, uh, you know, texture on top. You don't need to worry too much about last year's old foliage because the new stuff kind of comes out on top and it's actually quite quite attractive. Uh, no, there's very very little maintenance. I see that photo there on the left. It's all mature now and it turns nice and green. And uh, I don't see this very much either in the in public gardens or I never see it in my neighborhood. No one ever has this. You have the regular, uh, you know, the, the, the other dumb thing, like but not this one. So that's unfortunate. So but this is a great, great plant. So and in my in my neighborhood, I'm zone seven. It's it's uh, either at least semi evergreen, if not most years uh, evergreen. So it's, it's really, really pretty cool. Uh, this is a plant I used to love uh, in the, I used to work at a retail garden center and it was always, it smelled great and it flowered even when it was in the store and it sold like crazy and we would, you know, everybody would buy these things so they're so gorgeous and you see them in the neighborhood right now in my neighborhood, they're, they're very pretty, but it doesn't take much to go into the woods that way in my neighborhood and they're in the woods now, climbing trees. Uh, it's bad, you know, and, and it's it's too bad because it smells great and it looks gorgeous. And you can see that glowing over an arbor in like a rose garden or something. It'd be beautiful, but uh, uh, it's 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 a bit of a problem. And I don't know if, yeah, it's it's too bad, but it's it's just um, it doesn't know when to stop. <laughs> so one one guy that does it's, it's a little bit more muted is another clematis, Virginiana. Okay, it's. Has very very similar flowers. You can see that picture there on the right, but uh, the, the foliage is much more toned down. There's at least two or three other uh, probably acceptable or doable clematis, and they're natives that you could that you could pick. I just picked this one because it's probably the most common, I think. And um, it's uh, it's a great plant. It, it really really is. But it's not going to bloom like you know um, uh, the regular the one that we just saw the sweet on. The sweet on just has to explosion of of, uh, of of color this is a little bit more muted and a little bit more toned down okay so um and it is in the it's in the Mononcaceae family so it is uh um as all members of that family are either toxic or semi poisonous or those kind of things so it probably would be pretty good against the deer i, I can't speak, speak to that but deer shouldn't mess with it too much Okay, this is another one of the poster children for uh, this, this talk will be Japanese barberry. You see it everywhere, planted everywhere. I mean, every just about every parking lot in the United States has this thing. Uh, pretty much every neighborhood has them. Uh, they really are just about impossible to kill. It can take quite a bit of, uh, obviously, full blazing sun down to a fair amount of shade. Uh, deer won't touch it. Deer, they're not going to eat it because the prick has some pretty good stickers on it, some prickles. So they're not going to mess with it too much. Um, and it's a very, and they do a lot of cultivars. The one on the right, kind of that rosy color. The one on the left is a little bit more crimson. Okay. Uh, but uh, the bad thing is with this guy, the one of the worst things is, is the birds will come and get the berry and they bring it to the woods, drop it there. But because it can tolerate shade, right? Well, then it has no bounds. You know, I mean, imagine if it hated shade and it, a bird dropped it in the woods. Well, then it would that be the end of it? It it, it it can take sun or shade, so it grows anywhere, and it, it's it's awful. Uh, very close to where I live, it's a sea of barberry, as far as the eye can see, way up in, and all you have these poor oak trees growing out of this this. You know, it just <laughs> it's awful. So. It's uh, something that we could definitely do without, but um, it's very prolific in the industry and, and grown everywhere. You know. So one of my favorite um, plants is Itea, um, Itea uh, virginica, and uh, it's another fantastic, you know, plant with incredible amount of um, versatility, full blazing sun, down to fair amount of shade, uh, great flowers in the spring. Amazing fall color. Uh, if you're into cultivars, there's lots of cultivars to choose from. Uh, I have it in the rain garden at home. It, it gets that much water. If it rains that much at, at like dinner time, uh, and then the next morning, it's still in my rain garden this deep. It's still it's quite happy. Tons of water, can't hurt it. A great plant. Uh, great, great fall color. 
Uh, if you're going to prune it, you could uh, prune it uh, right after it flowers if you want to, to keep it, maybe if it gets a little rangy for you. But uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful addition to the, to the garden. You can put just about anywhere. Now, Father Gilla, uh, oh, by the way, this plant, uh, so for Barberry, since it's such a nasty fellow, I've got two alternatives. One is, one is Itea and two is Father Gilla. Father Gilla is in the uh, Hemalaceae family, so that's the witch hazel family. So that means it's going to bloom pretty early. And it's also got great fall color, just like the witch hazel does. Amazing fall color. Uh, there's Father Gilla gardenii, which is this guy here. But there's also uh, Father Gilla major, which is a little bit taller. Um, but uh, this is, you know, the gardenia is only three to five feet. Major's mm, probably six, maybe six to seven. Um, got nice fall, uh, nice uh, bluish color throughout the summer, and then it turns that gorgeous uh, orange in the uh, in the fall. And because it's that silvery color, I bet you, at least in my yard, deer don't touch it. Typically, things that are silver like that, deer are going to stay away from. So it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. And it blooms uh, before any foliage comes out. So it's really quite striking in early. It's like uh, March, April-ish. So mine bloomed for a very, very long time this year, which is great. So another one of the plants on the hit parade here is uh, uh, Euonymus solatus, uh, a burning bush. That beautiful plant. I mean, you got it, that is pretty, right? And that was in the woods, that it's pretty. But the problem is it loves it so much. It just, he loves himself so much, he spreads himself everywhere. You can go to the woods and see this as far as the eye can see. Uh, the bad news is that one, it does that, so it becomes a monoculture, but also nobody can use it. No birds, no, no insects chew the foliage, no birds go out really after berries. The exposure to the berries are fairly not very nutritious. The bird might grab it, spit it out over there, and don't get much out of it. So it's good for the spreading, but not very good for the bird. And uh, it can take quite a bit of shade, so it can go into the woods and do quite well. And uh, But I see them everywhere. Okay, so it's really, really a problem. You see that photo there on the top right? Look how many seedlings popped up there. That is awful. You know, so you can imagine that being in the beautiful parks around your home. Uh, so I, I figure that one of my favorite flowers, or one of my favorite um, shrubs is uh, Aronia, either Abutifolia or Melocarpa, the red or the black uh, choke cherry. But it's another four season plant. It's got beautiful uh, white flowers in the spring, fantastic fall color, nice shape all year, um, incredible fall color. And then the, both the black as well as the red, um, the berry actually stays on the, the shrub quite a while, uh, which is kind of a neat feature to have in the, uh, the wintertime. The birds don't seem to strip it because I think they're pretty astringent, pretty bitter and sour. So the birds will leave it alone until they're ripe. And that might be like in February, which is kind of a neat feature, okay? The black choke cherry, the one there on the bottom, is a, it almost looks like as big as, a, a, I guess, a marble. And it's actually quite succulent looking. It's, it's a, quite striking. So, and they do sucker quite a bit. They do put up quite a bit. So you'll be able to have, in a couple years, uh, if you want to control it, make it a little bit neater, just cut them out. Okay? Just get a pair of snippers and just prune, it, prune those out. But I think every garden should have something, uh, have an aronia in it. They're wonderful. And there's lots, if you're into cultivars, there's lots of cultivars to choose from. Uh, another one that's surprising to a lot of people, people think, well, if it's butterfly bush, it must be good, and, and, uh, which is kind of ironic because, of course, the plant that's the sole food for the monarch butterfly is butterfly weed, and that's, of course, Asclepias tuberosa, <laughs> but this is butterfly bush, so you would think it would be good for, uh, uh, you know, pollinators and pollinating guarding and all that type of stuff, but it's not. It, it, one, yes, it has a nectar that the critters will go after, all pollinators. But the, the foliage is alien to them. They don't know what to do with it. So it just kind of sits there. Um, but you can see why it's popular. It's got a great flower. It's good for butterflies. will come, you know, the beautiful butterfly in summer will land on it. But nobody can use it. And then more importantly, we're finding particularly in maybe areas south of where I am and maybe other parts of the United States, it does go into the forest because it is spreading. And you can see from the photos here, it can, every, anywhere the seed lands, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean something. So that that photo there, that little uh, larvae is is an Asclepius. I'm sorry, a spice bush. Uh, um, um, when, um, yeah, so yep, yeah, spice bush and um, Lindira. That's what was big enough. Lindira uh, benzoin and um, so definitely 
try to think about not just the pollinating on the flowers, but also what can I do to offer them some foliage they can eat off of, okay? Basically the host, the host plant, they call it, okay? So this is a wonderful uh, addition, I think, to any garden uh, would be clethora. You gotta have a clethora in your garden. If you have a spot in your garden that gets kind of wet and squishy and wet, and you don't know what to do with it, nothing else grows there, put a clethora in, I'm sure they'll be very, very happy. Great um, fall color, which is kind of a bright yellow. Uh, if you're into cultivars, there are a lot of cultivars to choose from. There's even one called Ruby Spice, which is uh, kind of a, a pink. And then there's one called Hummingbird, which is even a shorter, so it's not the six to eight feet. Um, but uh, if, you, if you like that and you, need, and you need that height, you know, get the spray on the folia and it, it, it does quite, quite well around here. You, you could prune them if you wanted to, either uh, at the end of the season, if it looks too rangy for you, can take that. It's very, very adaptable. It's great for butterflies, bees, uh, even hummingbirds. So it's definitely something that I think that every garden should have, okay? Uh, and, and I've even seen it in normal, doesn't have to be in a wet, squishy area. It could just be regular soil. Be very, very happy. Uh, this plant is a button bush. It probably does need a little bit more moisture. Uh, how it would do in normal garden soil, I found it might get a little bit ratty if it's uh, if it's in normal soil and you know. But I found that if if it does get a little bit ratty, a little bit rangy, if you give it a good haircut with a pair of pruners and prune it really hard, it responds very, very well. Loves the full sun. Can take tons of water if you want. But it really is a pollinator magnet. I mean, critter critter just go into this thing almost immediately in your garden. Okay, butterflies big time. So, and there's tons of uh, uh, cultivars available. So uh, it's it's really really I think something. And it's big though. You know, it's 10 feet, 15 feet sideways. So uh, it's it's not a little shrinking violet. You need to put it in an area where it's allowed to get big. I think there's one cultivar. I think the sugar shack is. It's fairly diminutive in size, so it's a little bit better for you if you don't need it that big. Uh, this is kind of the a kind of sad thing actually, because if, if when I was working at a garden center, someone wanted something that could take sun or shade, deer won't touch it, evergreen, well, Nandina domestica will do all that. Okay, uh, it's extremely popular. It's in every uh, parking lot of every gas station around. Uh, every every uh, you know parking lot of every shopping center because it, it's so tough it can take any kind of condition but the birds will drop it uh, drop the seed and then we have the whole invasive issue but also uh, no critters can use that foliage okay so it's basically just you know putting a piece of plastic in your garden and have it you know there but no, no no one can use it so it's really just for our amusement and, and nothing else okay so we can do better than that. So, and when I was making this, putting this presentation together, I remembered that the, the berries are toxic to certain birds. So cedar waxwing is one of them. So that was another reason why that, that's not good. So I, I, I had forgotten that. So that's another reason. One of my favorite plants, because it really is a, a four, another four season uh, shrub. And the winter time, the stems get kind of cinnamony. Uh, cinnamony. They're kind of uh, exfoliating. I mean, the bark peels a little bit. It's got a, it's got a, Fantastic, uh, nice shape in the, in the, in the wintertime, the branching. Uh, beautiful, uh, almost like a panicle type flower. Very, very pretty. I love the, I love the foliage. It's got that oak looking leaf to it. Uh, hence the name, uh, oak leaf hydrangea. Um, uh, and it's got incredible fall color. I mean, that is just gorgeous. Imagine the whole thing being that, you know, it's five to seven feet tall and wide, all looking at that color. It's quite impressive. And it can take, from pretty much basically full blazing sun to part shade, okay? So this is an, another huge, huge problem uh, because one big thing that, you know, a lot of people want is they want their neighbor to kind of disappear. They wanna have a screen in the backyard. They want this big whoop screen to go up. So they're either gonna plant something like this or they're gonna plant, uh, you know, a Leland Cypress or Emo Green Arborvitae or uh, Green Giant Arborvitae or, you know, some kind of screen. Well, in that sense, this thing does perfect. The only problem is bamboos, there's no off switch and it grows like nobody's business. So, and, it, and it's not necessarily by seed, it's by these 
it puts out another shoot and that thing that comes up out of the ground is as hard as a rock and to, to try to remove that is extremely difficult uh, it's extremely difficult and it's like a bulldozer to any um, uh, any natural area that it would encounter it just keeps going and not, not, nothing would stop it so it's really really uh, a big big problem so and um, I, my in-laws have it in their backyard from the neighbors. It's come over under the fence now, and my my in-laws' fence is probably going to be destroyed at some point. But it's uh it's it's a it's a big deal. So if we and again nothing can. There's no insect can use it. There's no butterfly that can eat this foliage. There's no flower that anybody. It's just big inert thing, you know. It's like plastic or steel, like metal. So so I was thinking, you know, there's not that many broadleaf evergreen. Um, there's not that many broadleaf evergreens in the mid-Atlantic states where I live, you know? So, um, so they're because people want that screen. But a couple of years ago, when I was at Air and Space, we had a thicket, basically, of, of these Ilex Paticillatus winterberry planted. And it was done in a way that you could see that, yeah, the leaves fall off. This is a, this is a deciduous holly. The leaves will fall off, and actually it made kind of a screen. You don't really need to have all that stuff there. So that's kind of a neat way of thinking about it because there's not that many broadleaf evergreens here in the mid-Atlantic states. You know, there's, you know, there's inkberry and there's uh, Mount Laurel and, you know, uh, probably bayberry would be another one. But other than that, the list is pretty short, pretty quick. But, you, but then I saw that and you don't need it. This is planted dense and it has these beautiful thicket uh, type approach, comes out of multi-stem coming out of the ground. You need, you need a male and female to get the berry, okay? Uh, so that you need two. But it's easily found in the industry. Got tons of cultivars if you're into that. Um, but it's a nice vase shape. And you can see there the photo on the right, a fantastic yellow, beautiful uh, uh, fall color. It's gorgeous. So, and of course, birds are going to covet the, covet the berry. This one's also surprising to people. They think my burnums, they think, what's the problem with that? Well, people don't know that there are actually quite a few uh, non-native uh, invasive um, um, viburnums. There are, there are several non-native, the ones that are not invasive, like uh, Carlesii and Carcephalum and so forth. But these ones are um, uh, definitely invasive and they're a huge, huge problem. So the good news is there's no reason to go that direction because we've got two wonderful, at least two, uh, three. I could have made more slides just on viburnum. But this is viburnum dentatum. Uh, the arrowwood, uh, it's, it's fantastic. It's uh, kind of a kind of woodland type effect. Very tall and rangy in its old age. It's very lovely. See the picture there on the right. Uh, it is a host plant for uh, for, for several um, lepidoptera, several several butterflies. Can get quite large, um, and it has a nice purple purplish um, uh, a berry, mm, probably May or June somewhere in there, and uh, it's, it's it's great. So and and birds will come after the uh, the fruit big time. Um, and there's the, the there's the fruit there. There's the fall color. It's it's a great plant. So I think every garden should have one of these too. So and actually this is one of my favorite plants. This is viburnum nudum. Okay, uh, it's another one of our great natives. Uh, got fantastic uh, fall color on those berries. Birds will come and strip that off. And uh, look at that picture on the left with those berries. I mean, that looks like almost artificial. That's not Photoshop, by the way, that's real. And then the picture on the right is just beautiful fall color as well. And they go really, really well with all plantings, you know, perennial and so forth below. Um, and this is Bishop's weed, Adipodium, is a real problem. It's in the carrot family. So it actually is kind of good for pollinators, but it has no off switch, gets into the wild and just goes, goes like crazy. It'll spread very, very quickly. Um, the variegated one that's also in the trade is probably not as vigorous as the plain green one, but they both are problematic um, for obvious reasons. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's something that was quite common. Uh, I've seen, seen it actually um, earlier this spring, I, I saw some coming up in a, in a neighborhood thing. So I, that's unfortunate. So this is uh, our native. This is Zizia aurea. This is uh, Golden Alexanders. It's actually another carrot family member. Uh, has the same flowers, just that it's 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 in the carrot family. 
Um, it's great for pollinators. Got that flat kind of surface that the the, the bee would would able to land on. Uh, plays well nicely with others. You can see it here on the photo on the right uh, with um, that looks like a geranium possibly, um, and it's just beautiful. Uh, it does spread judicially very easily, so it, it's not a shrinking violet. It, it does its thing very quickly horizontally, but it's always in bounds. It's not totally. It's not going to eat your house like some of these things we've been talking about during this lecture. It's more more gentle spreader. Okay, and if it does get a little bit too wacky for you, you could easily either dig and remove or easily reduce it. It's not even an issue, but it's it's a lovely plant to have in your garden. So zizia. Uh, common periwinkles, very, very common in the industry. It's very uh, easy to find and uh, it's too bad because it does a lot of cool things. It's got a nice flower, evergreen, uh, deer won't touch it. So uh, I, I was reading when I was making a, making this presentation, I did find that it does possibly some allopathic uh, properties to it. Uh, that just means that there are certain chemical properties in the plant which makes other plants not um, happy in that area, in its, in its company. So you can see how that would be beneficial to the plant, but also you can see how then it becomes such a problem. Because if it escapes, it's gonna eradicate everything else. So it really, almost the definition of a monoculture. So wonderful um, a native plant, okay? Barren strawberry, Bostinia, has a, uh, the name Phrygoides looks like a, um, uh, looks like a strawberry uh, foliage. Cute little uh, yellow flower, good for pollinators, particularly in the early season. Um, kind of evergreen. Keep off the. Uh, you might want to go out there maybe in January, February, and make make sure there's not too many leaves on top, because uh, it probably wouldn't like that too much. Particularly in maybe in March when the new vo new foliage comes out, keep the keep the keep it kind of clear. But other than that, it's a really really nice plant, and I think everybody's easy to find. You should be able to find this. It's good. It's a good good plant. Nice thick clump. A nice mat, almost like the the, the vinca wood. Another one of my favorite plants, another great uh, native, is uh, Eurebia de Vericata. They it used to be Astra de Vericata. They changed the genus name, but great ground cover, great flower. Uh, becomes a nice mat. Really, really takes off. A good, you know, two feet across this way. And the foliage is about yay, but then the flower goes above above that, so it goes in nicely with heucheras and and uh, those kind of uh, plants and, and hellebores. And so good plant, good addition to your garden, it's wonderful. Um, now the plant's a little surprising for people, so everybody loves Lily Valley, but it, it does spread, it is invasive, um, and it's a problem, it does colonize pretty quickly. You can see from that photo, it's, it's doing its thing. It's just gonna keep going through the woods there. Um, a Tiarella cordifolia is a, a great, I thought a good substitute for this. Okay, because it's a nice mat. Uh, they, I guess kind of sort of maybe at the same, this might be a little bit later, but kind of sort of at the same time. Um, I've never had a problem with deer on it. I think it, I think it does okay. Um, and uh, it does spread, but you gotta, uh, the big thing is you gotta keep, it doesn't really like to be, uh, doesn't want to go dry. Okay, so maybe a nice thin layer of mulch would not be a bad idea. So keep it on the moist side. So at least damp. So, and then I thought I'd squeeze this in here as an extra slide. Three different uh, ferns, and I had wanted to pick three ferns that would kind of tell a different story. So the fern there in the middle is Christmas fern. It's an evergreen, so that's kind of unusual. Okay, uh, and it's not going to go all the place. It's kind of a clumper. It's, it does from that center thing. It's just going to keep getting it a little bigger, a little bigger. The fern there on the left, the lady fern, you can see from that photo, is coming up here and there and everywhere a little bit, which is fine. If you have the area, it's very, it's not overly oppressive. It's only, you know, one feet tall, two feet tall. So uh, it's gentle, it's doing its thing. Um, it probably, um, you shade for sure on the lady fern. If you had it in sun, probably need to bump up the water just a tad, okay? Um, and the thing about Christmas fern and lady is they can take, hmm, um, cer certainly, certainly Christmas fern, you, you, it can take dry shade better than most, that's for sure. And I had to throw in cinnamon fern because it really is very, very elegant. I mean, wow, what a beauty. And I, I found so many beautiful pictures of, of 
cinnamon pearl when I was putting this presentation together. I didn't know which one. But it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous plant. It looks like almost tropical, and then it, and then it has those those uh, those fronds coming out of the middle, that little cinnamony thing, and that looks really really special. So it does need moisture though. It probably so those on the left are more dry, and this guy over here would definitely be uh, on the on the moist side. Okay. Um, uh, Lithrum, purple loosestrife. If you go if you go in a car and you not so much around here, but like upper New York State and Michigan and Wisconsin and so forth, on the roadsides and the wetlands, as far as the eye can see, and you can still see this sometimes sold. It's often sold as an aquatic plant, so it's a it's a bit of a problem. And um, uh, I was thinking that if you needed that upright shape, uh, by the way, because it's sad because lithium is quite pretty and you have it in the garden at just one, it, it does has that purpley upright image that you see there. Okay, but it, but it spreads and it's not native and it's not good. So whereas the Liatris, um, there are several different species to, to get. Um, this one is spicata, it's a little bit uh, clumpier, a little bit, you don't need to stake it, Stays fairly upright compared to some of the other ones. The other one's kind of, I got some in my backyard uh, where they kind of lean over a little bit. This one is very, very upright, okay? Um, and uh, I have it in my, I put it in here, I put it in my rain garden, but it's at the dry end, because it would not like, it will rot if you have it too, you know, in soaking areas. But, um, and, uh, and to my knowledge, I put it in here, but it, so I was, I my, whenever I say this, I cross my fingers because everybody's a little bit different. Deer have not touched mine. So, which is, which is always a good thing. Okay. Another very tall upright guy would be uh, New York ironweed, uh, Vernonia, and uh, very tall. It, what, what's neat about this, this one is kind of a late, mid, a midsummer late bloomer. So it catches all those bees and butterflies when they need something to do like in August, almost September. So it's um, very tall and it's a wonderful plant and everybody should have one. It's, a, it's really, really cool. So uh, Houtinia, we have some American history that I've been trying to eradicate now for about two years now. Um, you can ID it very easily if you're down there and you're weeding and it's a weird fishy smell. That's a uh, Houtinia. Okay, it's also called the chameleon plant. It is kind of pretty, I'll give it that. And there are different, uh, Lots of different colors, really nice red stem, a lot going on, but it will spread like crazy, just like we said a hundred times now, go into the woods and make a mess. Uh, and I thought I would try two, two uh, uh, Carexes, two sedges, to uh, be a good substitute, okay? Um, and uh, great, great natives. I have both these in my backyard, both in my rain garden, and they both get flooded whenever it rains and quite happy getting fatter all the time this way, horizontally, holes onto the soil. No weeds are gonna be in there. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And because the tusset moth, which is the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the which is um, a is a, um, a host plant for uh, lepidopters, which is kind of cool. And uh, they both are actually. And so it, that's kind of a, you can't, you can't miss with that. And actually they're quite attractive. So I mean, with that beauty and that cool stuff, why would you plant a, a princess variety? You would need to. That's just it's wonderful. So, um, and uh, let's see here. This is my grass. I put all the grasses on one page, and just so we can put them in a big bag and beat up on the bag all at once. Um, so, I think these are miscanthus is all over the woods around my neighborhood, uh, and always on the edge because they don't like the shade. They stay right on the edge, but they're they're horrendous. I haven't seen too much pampas grass escape, but um, it's, it's, it is what it is. And what's too bad about it, because we have these wonderful grasses here that are available to us that are actually, believe it or not, host plants, who knew, host plants for butterflies or on grasses. I mean, who would have thunk that? But it's, it's a wonderful thing. The Cisacrium, the one on the left, the little blue stem, it's got this incredible uh, pinkish, purplish color all summer long. And then when you go into the fall, the whole thing turns pinkish purplish, all of a sudden it goes purplish orange. And the whole thing is just amazing. We have a couple of uh, in American history right now that are gorgeous. Um, and Panicum, the one on the far right, is actually pretty good size. Um, sometimes you gotta stake it. Definitely have it in sun. I have some at the building that are in too much shade and they, they, they fall over too easily, but they really should be um, quite impressive in the garden. Put them in the back. 
there's one variety, yeah, the variety right there is called North Wind, and North Wind is very upright, okay? Uh, and I had one actually took quite a bit of water and did quite well, but it's gotta be in full sun, so that's, that's the kicker, okay? And then there's Indian grass, sorgastrins. It's, it's just, they have beautiful blue color. I mean, what kind of, amazing how many things you can put in front of that as a great contrast if you were designing a garden. I mean, that's just how lovely is that? So, um, so yeah, so grasses are uh, a whole new ball of wax. You probably could have just one, almost any one of the things that I talked about today, you could probably put in a, in a, uh, a presentation on. So we could do one just on grasses native grasses. It's wonderful. So, and that's all I have. I'm coming back. I'm quickly answering questions <laughs> on the, the chat box and Q&A. So mm -hmm. thank you, Alex. That was just terrific. There's so much to learn on this topic, so much controversy on this topic. Like, how do you determine if something's native? Where is native? What is native? Right. When is native? All that. So right. we'll have to have another discussion yes, just absolutely. to tackle that. Because, um, uh, you know, uh, for instance, like if, like if, uh, take like Father Gilla or even the oak leaf hydrangea, mm -hmm. those are native plants, but they're not native to where I live in Maryland. Maybe, maybe if they're native to uh, like Western Maryland, close to West Virginia in the mountains, but they're not native to my, to my area. But I would put them in my garden, and I'm going to call that a native plant, right? Right. Uh, certainly better than a. Then you can say, well, yeah, I know because it's better than a than a Japanese barberry, right? For for obvious reasons. So um, the definition, I know, like I said earlier, I know it sounds a little wonky, and you might want to have, you know, roll, roll your eyes a little bit about all these definitions and why don't make it so complicated. I I, choose, I garden because I want to have fun, but uh, I got it absolutely, but. Um, you know, there, there's a reason why some of the stuff's a little tricky, you know, uh, because certain insects come to a Japanese barberry and they don't know what to do with it. They can't do anything with it. So, yeah, you know. I, I, what I would always recommend to people too, remember native, it's not just native to a specific state, it's native to a specific region and ecosystem. So even though it might say it's a Virginia native plant, is it a Virginia native plant that grows in the Piedmont, that grows in the coastal area, that grows in the mountains? Look at your conditions and see where that plant grows natively. And can you provide those conditions? Because we have so many different types of planting areas just in the Mid-Atlantic area. So it may be like Amalankir is native to uh, at the edge of a woods. It's not native as a street tree. So always look into where a plant grows, not just in a not just in a state in a in a fake line, but in an ecosystem, and that's going to help you out more than anything else. Uh, the other one that's getting asked, we have like two minutes left. How do you help if you're planting native plants on your garden uh, in an area that has a lot of invasives already? How do you help those native plants outcompete? The invasives well uh well certainly the invasives have to go uh i would strongly look go to your county extension agent there's tons of websites like you know the national forest service and uh, park service and and uh wildlife fund and all those kind of places would have websites to about how would you possibly eradicate some of these because there is based on the plant there's a little different biology in each one about when right. to pull it, when to cut it, when to spray it, when to dig it, when to cut it back and then dig it, all that stuff. Everyone's a little bit different. So I would definitely um, go and um, uh, probably look at some of those, uh, that, that literature. And um, you have to give your, because these things are going to be faster than your natives and they will outcompete them if they're actually on your property. You got you to gotta get them off, right? If you have a wooded property or if it, it, it's, and every year you wait, it's going to get worse. Right, we know this. If you have porcelain berry and you think it's bad this year, wait two years, you're <laughs> going to have a worse times ten. You know, so um, you just get on it. Really, I mean, not to be funny, you really you have to. So yeah, and I agree. Just keep on watching it. Your shadow is the best, uh, yes. uh, most conducive way to be able to help out your garden and yes. any area that you have around your garden. So right. 
with that, Alex, thank you again for such a great presentation. We really enjoy it. By the way, you mixed up mimosa tree with tree of heaven. So oh, really? different people. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So right. um, but that's all right. The two the two spotted <laughs> lantern fly is doing a good job of eradicating <laughs> the alley yeah, right. mm -hmm. and, and some of our areas. Yeah. Of course, it's not not good to have the spotted lantern fly because they also have a taste for peach trees and yeah. many other things so all, all, all fruit trees right all fruit trees so yeah. one problem leads to another uh, right. but thank you again uh, you're getting applause you can see at the bottom it's floating up from the bottom we really mm -hmm. appreciate everyone that has been watching and we will continue to talk about the subject and provide more information because we do think it's so important. I want everybody to realize too, that when you new, use native plants, you can use them in formal situations like we do at Smithsonian Gardens. It does not have to be a, a field or anything else. Use them in your gardens the way you would use any other plants because they're just as beautiful, if not more, because they're covered with all kinds of wonderful visitors. Grow native. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>